Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marilyn Shannon, and this is the Breaking Free Show. I hope you're all doing well today, wherever you are. And uh, we're having some pretty weather today, so that feels really good. Well, welcome. We have a really interesting show in store. Uh, we have a friend back, so we're always excited when somebody comes back and visits us. So please make sure to join us in our chat if you like. You can put your name, your nickname, whatever you like, underneath the window. You can call us anytime into the show at 919-518-9773. Or you can come in on Skype voice, no picture, just a voice, at computers, that's plural, then the number 2K voice. We'd love to have you. We invite you anytime. This is your show. This is an opportunity for us to kind of sit back together and just kind of chat. So before we introduce our guests, let me say hi to Amnon. Hello, Marilyn. How are you? I'm good. And you? I'm doing just fine. Thank you. Yes. Did you have a nice weekend? I had a great weekend. Yeah. In what way? Um, well, I worked Saturday. Then yesterday, uh, after the, I had a good show. Then I went shooting. You went where? I went shooting. Oh, at, a, at a range. Yeah. And I, I never heard call, you say that. Then I got a call that my cousin from Canada is in town. Ah. I haven't seen him probably about 20 years. Oh, isn't that and nice? He, uh, That's they, nice. Were, they were flying to Miami and he heard on the radio that there were some thunderstorms and he said, I don't land in bad weather. So they turned around uh -huh. and they came to Raleigh, which was good weather. And they called and we went out to uh, dinner, oh, and how nice. then they came over here, and this morning they got on their plane, and oh, they kept going. 20 years. Yeah. First cousin. First cousin. Wow, that's nice. It was nice. That's was, very yeah. nice. It's always good to see family. It was It was great. All right, so here we go. Kelvin. Kelvin, are you there? Here. I'm here. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I'm then talking about weather and, you know, what happened here in Los Angeles yesterday, I think is the elephant in the room for a lot of people it, with Kobe's uh, helicopter crash and so forth. Absolutely. So, so, so Kelvin has been on our show before. He is a past life expert, one of my favorite subjects to talk about. And today <laughs> is an interesting day because of all that's gone on with Kobe and the the helicopter crashing and so we started talking about it a little bit before we went live but we have lots of things to talk about so yeah that's pretty yeah. much the elephant isn't it yeah it's the elephant in the room it's interesting kobe bryant dying yesterday uh and uh you know being a boston guy i i've never really been a lakers guy but uh growing up in boston but um i played basketball and so i always um admire great basketball players and he was a great basketball player really talented guy and he's you know the second part of his life here starting to do more yeah, uh yeah. work with his family and more charitable work etc cetera, etc cetera. um so really at 41 years old to uh, plucked out off of the planet um in that crash so it's interesting um you know you and i were chatting beforehand and um i was going to mention that uh he died, I found out, well, I, I found out that he died right after the first session of my Afterlife and Reincarnation uh, six-part video conference series that I do live every other week. I've been doing it for a couple of years now. I just kind of rotate through every, every few months. I do another one, uh, another series. And yesterday was the first session of the six-part series titled and the title of yesterday's session was What Happens After We Die? And one of my students texted me right afterwards, and he said, oh, you, did you see Kobe died? And I said, what? And, um, and I, you know, I turned on the TV and so forth. And evidently, the, the helicopter crashed around 946 in the morning, L.A. time. I live in, LA, I live in Los Angeles, as you know. And... Um, so I would I would have started I started the uh, the talk at 10 a.m. and so right at the, about the time that the nine people who died in the helicopter crash were on the other side going what the heck just happened my body is is dis 
it's incinerated or disintegrated, whatever, I don't know what, on the ground there in that helicopter wreck, and yet I'm still alive. Where am I? So, so back up a minute. So first yeah. of all, yeah. Um, do you know ahead of time, like, is there an instinct that you know, some kind of, some, some kind of thing that you know is, is going to get ready to happen when something like that happens or clinicians oh, and stuff? I, a lot of, some people tap into that. I don't, I, 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 have I ever, yeah, in my lifetime, yeah, but uh, I didn't get anything, I didn't get a hit, I call them hits. So I get hits about different things, but I don't, I didn't get a hit. Well, what this. about like, Kobe or one of the other, I mean, do they have some kind of premonition before oh, they does go? A per, does a person? Yes. Well, sometimes they can. Yeah. So absolutely. Sometimes they can. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very common. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't happen all the time. So I think with all of these kinds of around afterlife or pre right before death kind of experiences, what we need to be careful of is when we hear an anecdote, whether that's from me, you or anybody. Um, and, and then we extrapolate from that and think that that's the way it is for everybody. No. So does it happen? Yes. Does it always happen? No. Okay. But yeah, but I think it's a very common experience. You can get a little hit about yourself. Like, Oh, I think I'm going to get right. so people have that experience. Yeah. So, so there's a lot to talk about here and, and endless. And so I need some help from the audience too, because there's a lot of questions that I would like to ask, but maybe there's some that you want to ask too. So please feel free to, to call in and chat with us as well. So first so, of all. I was just going to say, Marilyn, yeah. so, uh, so quickly, right after this finish, I finished the session, people were saying in my class, they were saying, wow, uh, we were saying, wow, it would have been interesting if some or all of those nine people who just died a few minutes while before I started talking about what happens when you die were perhaps eavesdropping. Sometimes I'll get a hit a feeling that there's there the room is full kind of too i i didn't yesterday but uh, i was just immersed in talking at the time but you know who knows right, right? So, so so start us off with what happens when you die well in a nutshell uh we'll do the short version of this you know when we die um our mind continues that's been my experience that's been experience of many people who i know friends and so forth um, is that in, in people who've had NDEs, near death experiences, et cetera, um, is that our mind continues. Now, when I use the word mind, uh, you can substitute soul, spirit, consciousness, awareness, all the same thing as far as I'm concerned. Because when I talk about mind, I don't just mean our focusing part of our mind, I mean that plus, you know, our, our huge mind, the vastness of our, of our mind. Um, so that continues. Our physical body dies, that continues. And then we have many experiences when we die. We could, uh, different, per, different people can have different experiences, in other words. Sometimes people experience a tunnel of light. Some people don't. Sometimes they're just in a star field. Sometimes they just bump on the other side, and it's filled with light. So there's all variations of how you get there um, for different people. And uh, uh, there's no one way. And, uh, but you end up in this place of full of light energy because you are our we are uh light energy that's what our mind is is light energy and so um it's no, it should be no surprise to anybody but it is a surprise to everybody <laughs> when they have the experience that whoa i'm in this place filled with light it's amazing and i feel so connected and everything well that connection and that love and the people people use the word love humans use the word love um to, to describe that connection, it's all loving and all this other stuff, which I understand why they use that. But if you have had meditation experiences, turning within oneself in a very deep way, not not through some you know uh, not through some um, surface level type of turning within, but a very deep level of turning within, an easy, effortless way of deeply turning within. That experience of love and connection and light and expansion becomes a normal experience for you. So um, I think when people don't have that, which most people don't, when they go to the other side or they have the NDE, they're initially blown away, which is understandable. I get, I get it because the contrast is so great. 
from what they normally experience in waking state, right? But it's a very normal experience. It makes sense, right? If you're energy, it's going to be light energy on the other side. And you're going to feel more connection with yourself. Mm -hmm. And that expansion of who you are is what people are so unfamiliar with that when you go to the other side, you experience not just the light of the other side structurally, but the light of who you are and the expansion of who you are uh, I think there's a lot of uh, conflation, confusion of where you are, where do you end and where does something else start? So, right? yeah. So you, I, I know you've mentioned many times that you've had many, many lives. Yeah. How do you know that? Well, have you, have you been, you know, hypnotized? Have you put, no. but how do you know that? So, so, so. First of all, I don't think that anything can be known absolutely for sure, proven scientifically. So anybody, anybody who says that I have scientific proof of this is um, on a marketing tour uh, to get attention because nothing can be absolute. These are experiences. Right. We're talking about experiences, whether it's an NDE, whether it's the experience of the afterlife. And what does and, and who's interpreting the experience? That person is interpreting it. So anything you hear from me is an interpretation of experience that I've had. Now, have I tried to connect the dots in a logical, rational way to try to come to the conclusion that these are real past life memories, reincarnation memories that I've had, for, you know, over the last six thousand years, twenty to twenty-five different lifetimes that that I recall? Yes, I've tried to connect those dots, and we can talk about that. But that's the disclaimer up front, I think that everybody needs to acknowledge, recognize that any experiencer of anything is interpreting his or her experience through their, through their thinking. Okay. So I try to do it through my thinking in a clear, rational way. Others will interpret it sometimes that way. And others will interpret their experience just through a dogmatic um, set of uh, religious beliefs or cultural beliefs, for example. So, 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 so tell us so, what you've processed. Tell us your experience. So, and, and let me, I hope before you do that, I hope yeah. everybody understands that, you know, Kelvin is one of the most practical woo-woos there is. And he is not saying everything is etched in stone. As you listen, it's not all etched in stone. A right. And I like that because I can be so sure of something. And at the same time, who knows? Yeah. Right. How do I know? I just know what I know. I don't know what, you know, unless you, and you do the research and you collect all the knowings that there is and you try to see some theme, some pattern into what people know. And you can figure some things out, but then again, how do you know? So, exactly. so go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to clarify yeah, no, that. No, that's, a, that's a great um, interjection. That's a great thing to interject into there um, <clears throat> because uh, we're all figuring it out and we have an eternity to figure things out. And we'll never ever figure everything out. No, nobody can be omniscient. No being can be omniscient because being omniscient and knowing everything means that you have to know what it's like to know nothing. So, so nobody can be omniscient. Think about that. You can People will have to unbundle that later. Listen to that again. But you can't know everything unless you know what it's like to know nothing. Well, that's impossible. So. Um, so we're, we have an eternity to figure things out. So we need to relax about, oh, what's the answer? Oh, is he absolutely right about this? So um, my first memory, so this is not the first one that I talk about, but I'm going to talk about the first one that I ever had. The first one that I talk about is in my book, which is the Carthaginian slave memory, right? We can talk about that later. Uh, <clears throat> but the first one that I ever had because there was third party corroboration of it to answer your question, Marilyn, about how do you know? You know, how do you know it's just not your imagination kind of making stuff up? You're having a vision or whatever. Uh, or you watch too many sci fi movies or whatever. Um, this experience I had, I uh, was, uh, let's see, it was, um, I was 26 years old when this happened. So it was a long time ago, 40, more than 40 years ago. And, uh, I um, was meditating in a group of people, a large group of people, 75 people who were meditating every day. Uh, we were meditating all day, every day uh, for two months straight. 
<clears throat> in Switzerland. And um, uh, during one of those group meditations where everybody's getting these Kundalini rushes, we didn't mm -hmm. call it that, but that's what it was, these energy rushes through your body um, and uh, going through all these different channels in your body, it feels just like rushing through you. Um, and so a lot of the people I was meditating with were sitting around these pieces of foam um, mattresses on the floor of uh, the hotel ballroom. So just wall to wall foam. And these guys are wiggling around and they're hopping around and this and that because they get these energy rushes. Um, it was all men. That's why I say guys. Um, segregated men and women were in different hotels. Um, and um, I flipped over on my back. I flipped over on my back. I was on my, my shoulders. My feet are up in the air. And I was being crucified upside down. And so that was the first experience that I had. But I didn't know that it was a past life memory. I, all I knew was I was being crucified. But I knew it wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't Kelvin Chin. Kelvin Chin's never been crucified this lifetime. Uh, and I hope to avoid that uh, again. It's not, a, it's not a pleasant experience. And, but then we would go for walks. We paired up. And we'd go for walks after each of the meal, lunch and dinner. I was walking with my friend George, George Hammond. I was walking with him through the pastoral Switzerland fields uh, up a path. And I to started to tell him about a dream I had had about eight months earlier. And in that dream that I had had eight months earlier, I was incredibly distraught, really upset, um, crying, and I was in a ditch, and it was dirt in my mouth and my face and everything, and um, and 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 I I had I could picture my 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 feet and so forth, and I could see the sandals, my worn sandals and so forth. So I knew it was very long ago, a couple thousand years maybe. I didn't know how long ago, but a long time ago. I started to tell him that dream. That was all that I had in the dream. No no other images. Um, I started to tell him that dream, and he said, and he, I, I, I just told him I had a dream, and then he told me what the dream was, and I said, um, how did you know what the dream was? And he said, well, you know you've been flipping over in your back for the last two weeks during the group meditations, and you're being crucified upside down. He said, you know who you are, and I said, no, and then so when, when we talked about it, because I've never really studied uh, the Bible or anything. Um, you know, I grew up Christian, Protestant, but I just didn't pay attention in Sunday school. I just, you know, teased the cute girls in Sunday school is what I did. But, um, but so, so that was my first memory. And then it started opening up more and more. So I had a third party. Um, validated. Uh, validated. You know, so, 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 right? yeah. So for most people, yeah. or not most people, because we don't want to be, we don't want to say that for some people. Yeah. How do some people do that? Is it from a dream? Does it come from meditation? You know, well, just practical great. life? How does it happen? So, uh, so there's that example, right? And I'll give you another example, completely different, okay? So another example, um, so that was a physical example with, uh, with, 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 with other, other things going on in my mind, right? Another example um, <clears throat> was... Um, it can start with people like what I call recognition memories. So you know what deja vu is? Everybody knows what deja vu right. is. Most people have had that experience. There are different degrees and levels of deja vu. You know, you kind of like, oh, wow, I, I swear, you know, I, we were here talking about that, and you said that, and I just I had this deja vu about that. You know, we've all had that experience, I think. Most people have. There's other levels of this. I call them recognition memories, where... You know, you kind of go to a place and you kind of go, wait, man, I've been here before. And you've never been to South, South Dakota before in your life. Not this lifetime, you've never been to South Dakota. And you're there in South Dakota with your family or your wife or your kids or whoever. And you're like, your, your husband, your boyfriend, and you're kind of like, I've been here before. It's so weird. This is so familiar. But you've never physically been here, been there this lifetime. We've had that kind of experience. I have another friend who has it with jewelry, certain types of jewelry. She has this affinity for it. I call them recognition memories. So when I went, 
uh, when, when I was five years old, my mom and I would go to the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. I grew up in suburbia, Boston. And um, my mom would go there with me and uh, she'd say, I was five, six years old, okay? I had my Mickey Mouse watch and we'd go in there and the, when the museum opened at 9 a.m. Saturday morning and she'd say, when Kelvin, look at your watch, when Mickey's little hand is on the 11 and Mickey's big hand is on the 12, I'll meet you right back here in the lobby of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Nobody would do that with their kids today. No. I'm five, six years old going, walking around the museum. Where did I go? I went to two areas in the museum. I went to the Egyptian mummies and I went to the medieval armor. That's where I went. The broadswords, the armor, and the 3,500 year old bags of dust and wrapped up in cloth. And I felt at home in those two areas. Five, six, seven, eight years old. We go there once, once a month at least. We go there. So, so you're saying, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong, but you're <clears throat> saying we to understand some of this, to be an observer in your life. Yeah. And how how do you get yourself to a position that you're clear enough to observe, to feel, to be witness to? I've been here before. You know, yeah. slowing down, things like that. But what else? Yep. And, is, and that must be for everybody, because every, because I mean, anybody, I think a lot of people have had these, I think more people have had these experiences than are willing to discuss. I think people need to talk about these things more. You'd find out that a lot of people have had experiences like this, but then they don't do anything with it. So I, so I don't think there's a big, to answer your question, the short answer is, I don't think there's a lot of stuff that people need to do more of. Mm -hmm. I think meditation and spending more time turning within is definitely a contributing factor to help unfold these things more. Absolutely. There's no question okay. about that. But <clears throat> I think more people have had these experiences and realize <clears throat> and they don't know what to do with it. So what I come up with, I, I, I have a, uh, a, a phrase, I say, follow the breadcrumbs. Follow the breadcrumbs. Remember Hansel and Gretel, the, the children's tale, but follow the breadcrumbs, right? So if you follow the breadcrumbs, it may lead you somewhere. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, for example, I had a conversation with a friend of mine, Josephine, um, several, so, some years ago. And, I, and she has this affinity to certain kinds of jewelry. Well, now we have the internet. Back in the old days, you could use the Encyclopedia Britannica. I've had, I've had to do that back in the old days, so forth. But now you get the internet. It's real easy. So now she can go and look at certain kinds of jewelry that seems to uh, look at images that seems to resonate with her in a certain way, mm -hmm. because her jewelry, her, her jewelry attraction was was serpent jewelry. That's that's unusual jewelry right there. She 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 narrowed it down to first century first century A.D. jewelry. She found rings that were really resonated with her that were made in ancient Egypt, but sold in first century Rome. That's a way to follow the breadcrumbs. Another way to follow the breadcrumbs is to just go to your library or just go on the internet. And if you're, you have this affinity with a certain time period, whether it's revolutionary war times, what, you know, this, you know, it's in the 1700s, or, or whether it's a Native American in a certain in a certain time period, or an African in a certain time period, or an Asian uh, in um, you know uh, in, in in certain time period, whatever. Go to that culture. You start researching a little bit in that culture. Follow those breadcrumbs and see if you find something that starts to really resonate with you, and then go down that. Road. And what do you do when you're going down that road? What do you what do you do with the information? You follow the breadcrumbs. So, and... so you follow the breadcrumbs. You're, you're, first of all, you're you're checking. You're doing a self check all the okay. time to see with internally, you know, and and no, not not so in, intellectually and emotionally. What is, is are you getting some stimulation from that resonance from that? Because um, <clears throat> I think that emotional patterns, the bottom underlying thing is you don't have to remember your past lives, but, if, but our pa emotional patterns that we have that are inherent in us for a long, long time, they can change. 
but they change very, very slowly over many, many lifetimes, my experience. And, it, and so you can look at your emotional patterns and start to follow those breadcrumbs that can kind of lead you to some me potentially some memories of other lifetimes. But even if you don't have memories of other lifetimes, it's not necessary to, to, to unfold yourself to yourself. That's what self-development is, right? Uh, but you don't need the memory itself but you, you can look at those emotional patterns that we all have within ourselves. So looking at things you like, looking at things you yes. don't like, really exam kind of exactly. examining things that pop exactly. up, right? Why do I really like that? It's like, it's crazy how much I like that. Or it's crazy how much it I abhor that. It just really bothers me. For example, I have this emotional pattern. Um, it really bothers me, women, women and children, when they get hurt or whether they're abused or whether they're taken advantage of. It just like, it's, it's like a visceral thing. It's like, it's not connected to some personal experience that I've had this lifetime with women and children. <clears throat> There's something else going on there. So that's an example. I followed those breadcrumbs and so forth. And once you follow the crumb, yeah. do you end up somewhere where you can actually see yourself somewhere? <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes you can. So, yeah, you could. So, for example, I'll give you an example. So I started having that memory or, or something. I didn't even know it was a memory. Okay, so let's, let's not call it a memory. When I'm five, six, seven, eight years old, I get this affinity, some attraction to mummies and armor, uh, medieval armor. <laughs> it's like weird. Yeah, it is you weird. <laughs> Very weird, right? Five to eight years old, just an affinity towards it. It's like a just like a magnet, like drawn to it, like a magnet, okay? So then fast forward. Um, after I had that memory that I told you about <clears throat> uh, being crucified, I, I started, I unfold, it just opened up, and I, about, within another few months, I think, or six months, within about six months of that experience, um, I had this experience where I was just lying down resting, so to, to your point, when can they come? They can come anytime, during meditation, outside of meditation, lying down, resting. I've had them come in the shower when I'm spacing out, just doing the, my normal thing. You know, I shave my head, as you can tell, uh, in the shower. So just like, you know, it's like, you know, I don't have to think anymore because I've done it so many thousands of times. So, um, you know, driving a car when, when the radio's not on. So these things can come at any, any moment, any time. But this, this one that I'm going to describe, describe to you came, I was lying down resting, I wasn't meditating, I wasn't asleep, I wasn't dreaming, I was in that in-between state, okay? All of a sudden, the TV screen goes on in my mind. You know, that TV screen that you have when you're dreaming, basically? It just flips on, and I'm seeing, I go into a room, of bi a big stone room, two foot by three foot stone block floors, wall ceiling, and I scuba dive so I can tell height very easily so it's like it's about 40 40 feet high maybe 50 foot high ceiling huge room and there was nobody in the room but i'm walking into the room so so when i say i you know just like in your dreams sometimes you you can look around in your dream same thing in this except i'm not asleep and i'm not dreaming i'm just lying there with my eyes closed um and this was 1977 and uh 1978 and i'm uh I'm kind of looking over my shoulder, you know, that, or looking like as if you had a camera on your head kind mm -hmm, of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm looking around the room. There's nobody in the room. All the furniture is pushed to the walls. There's nobody there. I'm alone in the room, big, huge room, except there's one piece of furniture in the middle of the room, and it's a full-length mirror, um, big, huge, full-length mirror. I walk up to the mirror, and I see myself, to your question, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. I see myself in the mirror, and I am a huge guy, a big guy, um, uh, tall guy, Caucasian, reddish blondish hair, red reddish beard, and um, full length chain mail. You know what chain mail is? No, no. Med medieval times. It's, oh yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. Little chains, yeah. like yeah. that, and they're, they're, you wear it to protect yourself from getting, you know, sliced with a sword or shot with an arrow and so forth. It's, it's armor. It's, but, but chain mail is what was used up until about 1400. Uh, plate armor didn't come into uh, being until around the 1400s. So um, this is material to my memory in a mm -hmm. second. So, so chain full-length chain mail, 
a white tunic with a cross on it, big red cross on it. So um, in my experience, this all happened in probably in a matter of a minute or two, but um, a split second after I knew that was me, a doubt went through me. And a millisecond after that, knowing this went through me along with this huge energy rush that went from my feet and it shot out through my head. Like huge energy just shot through me like sticking a fork in a toaster oven, you know, to get a piece of toast and you get a shock, except that times a thousand. It just shot through me. And um, with the knowingness that, that was me. And then I relaxed into it. And that memory is one of the two memories I have probably the most pieces of memory that have come over the last 40 years since I've had it. Now, to your qu earlier question about how do you know mm -hmm. and about external corroboration? Well, I knew I was big because I could see how big I was, but I didn't know how big. Uh, years later, I knew I was six foot five, 230 pounds. How do you know that? You know, and then you can look up and you can see who, who was in the Crusades, who was six foot five and about 225, 230 pounds, and who had reddish blonde hair. There are not too many people that big then. And the other thing that external corroboration I had was I was another time, separately, 20 years later, Marilyn, 20 years later. So this goes to the point of how nonlinear these things, memories can come to you. 20 years later, I was sitting meditating with my daughter in, uh, in a hotel room um, when she was in high school. And uh, I was meditating, and all of a sudden, I yelled out in my meditation, I yelled out, Saracens. And I was, I, I could see myself on horseback, dust in my mouth. I could taste the dust in my mouth, the emotions and the physical sensation. And I was, and I had a broadsword, and I was on horseback in battle. And I was yelling Saracens. I didn't know what Saracens was. I didn't know it was an adjective, a verb, a, a, a noun, or what. I had to look it up. This was 20 years ago. Okay. I looked up the word Saracens and found out that Saracens is the word for Muslims huh. prior to 1300. 1300 AD is when we started calling people who you know were followers of, uh, of Muhammad and, and uh, Islam and so forth. We called them Muslims in 1300 AD to present. Before that, they were called Saracens. So my memory was from the 1100s. When we called them Saracens, I was in the Third Crusades. So you've, you've obviously done a lot of work with this. So let's take the layman, the person who hasn't yeah. done anything, yeah. who's just curious, yeah. who um, you know, believes that, you know, believes you and that all your stories yeah. So they start following the crumbs mm -hmm. and they, and they start to go internally and they wait for more information and a picture or a, a feeling or something yeah. that starts them to see, Oh, wow. Something here, something there. Why is this matter? Why do yes. we want to know about these? these exactly. What is the importance of this? So like, what, what is it? What does it matter that you were a Muslim before? It doesn't matter. You know, I, I was fighting the Muslims then, so I was I was uh, I was um, English uh, at the time in the Third Crusades. But why does it matter? You were this or that. It doesn't really matter. So um, what matters is it goes to the what I always ask is the so what question. So what is to me past lives are just cocktail party talk. Who cares? You were in the Third Crusades or you were a Carthaginian slave. Uh, you were an African slave or in a Carthaginian warship uh, 2,300 years ago. Who cares about that? Um, what matters is taking um, information about ourselves, learning more about ourselves through these memories. That's what matters. If they unfold that type of self-knowledge about ourselves, then I think it's useful. Other than that, it's cocktail party talk. Who cares? Um, it's interesting. It's kind of fun. But so what? What matters is how do I apply that to help Kelvin Chin today in 2020? So take something from, so, so just briefly, you yeah, I'll briefly you from your experience, what have yeah. you taken to yeah. use for you? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you examples. Okay. So for example, the Carthaginian, so what, it, so in th 330 BC, now I had to connect the dots here. So this is the following the breadcrumbs. I'll give you an example. And, 
and how I use this to help me today, okay? But the, I had to connect the dots because the first experience I had of being this uh, African slave uh, was dying, was almost dying. I was had an, it was like a nearing death experience. I was being roasted in the sun on a piece of wreckage of, of, a, of a wooden ship. And um, uh, I, don't know, I thought it was in the ocean. It was a big, huge, vast, you know, whatever. And it was like a body of water. But it uh, turns out it was the Mediterranean. Because then I started having more memories of it. Uh, and I could see, and I saw the ship, and I was rowing on the ship, and so forth. And I could see the ship. And then I started to follow the breadcrumbs. And I look up, what kind of ship is that? When did those ships exist? Ships exist. Oh, I was on a Carthaginian ship fighting the Romans in, the, in, the, in one of the Punic Wars. It was around 330 BC. So that's how I connected those dots over many, 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 many uh, uh, years. What I took from that experience to apply today was the willpower I had to stay alive then. I willed myself mentally to stay alive because I could easily have let myself go. I was roasting in the sun. I'd been there for days with no food and water. And so, you know, you get dehydrated and everything, you get delirious and, and so forth. But I willed my mind to stay in my body to keep it going until I was uh, rescued by uh, some fishermen or something like that. And so I've used that today, for example, when I've gotten laid off five times since I was 50 years old, to will myself through to get a new job to, to, to pull it together, to get in front of the interviewers and to land another job. I did that five times since I was 50 years old with a family of four, two little kids relying on me to bring money in to feed them and to house them, clothe them the whole nine yards. And that, so that's very difficult. If you know anybody who's been laid off in the United States at 50 years old or older, there's age discrimination is rampant in the United States. Call a spade a spade. They just, they can tell how much experience you've had. And they, even if you don't put when you graduated from school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you never, you, you get deep sixed. You, 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 you don't get the interview. And even if you get the interview, you have to, you have to perform. You have to show that you are confident and that you can do the job, et cetera, et cetera. I did that five times since I was 50 years old. I've drawn from the Carthaginian, almost dying slave experience 2,300 years ago. So now you could have gone in without knowing that knowledge and had, had that sense about you, regardless. Yes. Right? And I think I've had that sense about me anyway. Right. My, my life, my mind. But having the conscious connection with it it, 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 gave, it gives you a whole different level of confidence. Right. So, when they, yeah. so, so when they say we are part of the collective consciousness, so Who's we are we? part, huh? Well, I, you know, you hear we're part of this oh. consciousness, right? We're part of the collective consciousness of everybody. But then we're part, then we are a collection ourselves of a consciousness. Yeah. So I would, I would agree with the latter and not the former. So okay. We're not, we're, we're not a collection of other people's consciousnesses. That's a conflation of a couple of ideas that I talk about in some of my lectures to try to unbundle and clarify. That, 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 that's a, a, con a conflation of the idea that, of oneness and that we're all connect, that, that, that we're, uh, connected. So being connected to other inanimate, uh, animate and inanimate objects, whether they be alive or in, uh, not alive, in other words, being con feeling a connection is different from being the same as. And so the whole idea of oneness and merging means sameness, means no individuality. That's a conflation with the feeling of feeling connected. I've had the feeling of being connected thousands of times in my lifetime with all animate and inanimate objects in the love, the connection between and amongst. I've had that feeling thousands of times, that experience thousands of times. That's not the same as saying I am one with them. You can say I feel like I am one with them. That's correct. 
it's incorrect to say I am one with them. Okay. Because you are okay. you are you retain your individuality. Okay. So okay. There's that. All right. Yeah. Okay. So now the collective, our own collective consciousness, because if you said with this vast yes. beingness, right? And we're, we, we are here, we were there, we're in this lifetime, that lifetime, we're taking that all in as part of our collective consciousness of our own. Of our own. So I would say that, so I use a different phrase than okay. our, that I'm a collective, of, you could say I'm a collection of many experiences, but there is a unique to my consciousness that continues. And okay. so you call that mind, soul, spirit, consciousness. Like I said, you can use different words. I use the word mind. My mind continues through, through many, many lifetimes. There, now, what aspect of my mind can we talk about linguistically that is more subtle than... Um, just Kelvin Chin, the body, and Kelvin Chin, the body of work of Kelvin Chin, what he has done in his lifetime experientially, is personality. So we can talk about personality continuing through many lifetimes. And I've looked at, I actually created an Excel spreadsheet <laughs> uh, of, of many lifetimes of mine, and then and, 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 and mapped out some of the personality traits that have continued through the thousands of years. You can get that. Wait a minute. Hold on. So you have been yeah. able to get that close to yeah. your past lives to, to know the personality trait. Some of them, okay. not all 20 of 20, 20, 25, not, not all of them, but a handful of them. Yeah. Because, um, because, so, because so here's the thing, you don't get like, Oh, you remember it's like, do you remember everything about Marilyn's lifetime, this lifetime? No. Who would want to remember it? I don't want to right. remember what I ate two weeks ago and so forth. But I get smidgens of stuff, right. and, there, and there's several lifetimes that I have which are that detailed, yes. So can you call upon yourself to, to go yeah. into a certain lifetime that you, of those 20-some-odd lifetimes, can you say, I want to go back here now? Uh, I, can I go back there now? I, 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 maybe, I, I just, I guess I'm grappling with that because I just choose not to. I, I'm, okay. I'm here a little now. Uh, I'm like all in right now. Okay. You know what I mean? I'm like, okay. I, I'm like here. I'm mm -hmm. not into doing like a past life regression of myself into one of these lifetimes that I remember lots of stuff to, stuff about. If there's useful stuff that can come from that lifetime, it pops up in my mind now. So, because I, I, I've opened up the pathway, right? Uh, but so, so I, so it's, it's like, again, I'm not into the cocktail party part of the, the, the lifetime thing. Is it, is it useful for me now? So, cause I'm all in on Kelvin Chin right now, living the life of, that I have now, right. right? But back to your collection thing, the personality thing, I think there's a personality, our personality tends to persist for a long, long time. Can it change? Yes. So we talk about there's the field of change, and then there's what's eternal. So this is a longer lecture here, but I'll just give you the short thing. <laughs> what's, what's eternal exists and is uninfluenced by the field of change. Because so, we, we evolve, right? We're evolving. Yes, so yes, it... we're evolving. So that, that's within the field of change. So I, I coined this phrase. People can come up with some other term, but I call it the essential me. There's an essential me that is eternal, that, that there's no beginning and no end. That's what eternal means. There's no creation. There's no destruction. That's what eternal me means. Mm -hmm. You can't have creation in eternity. People conflate that all the time. That makes absolutely no sense. Eternal means forever. No beginning, no end. So there's an essential me that... Um, that I think has existed forever and will always exist, that's different from my personality. My personality is a couple of steps up from that, okay, which lasts a long, long time. But there's an essential me that is eternal. Personality exists in the field of change, okay? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's... It's a little, it gets no, abstract. No, it's, it, it, I mean, it's if, interesting. If you really, if you really want to understand this stuff um, clearly, which is obviously that's my passion. You can tell I get right, excited. Right, 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 right. You know, to understand it clearly, 
you got to you you have to you have to you have to really understand it clearly and not start conflating things which is what most people do they conflate things they say well it's eternity but we do uh you know we do exist for eternity but no 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 my personality no no you can't you, there's some it, it's to be uninfluenced by the field of change that's what's eternal so i've coined this phrase as my essential me exists which has not been always human I would, you know, we've not, we've all not been human. We've been somehow human. Humanized. Before. Humanized. Who knows what we were before? Mm -hmm. I don't know because my human mind doesn't have conscious recollection of that. <clears throat> okay. You know, Kelvin, I've heard people say before with somebody who's passed away, let's say, mm -hmm. where they have seen a poem or something where that person knew they weren't going to make it past a certain age. They just, yeah. they just knew. Yeah. So like when you, t when we t talk about, let's say Kobe or yes. anybody. Yes. I, uh, so are there accidents to death or is death just, I know we've talked about this before. Yeah. So are there accidents to death? Like it's, it wasn't supposed to be and it just happened. And how do you explain that? Or is, is it not an accident? It was just, you're supposed to die. There's, there's, there's accidents and there's premonitions of experience and there are um, certain, we could call them soul contracts. All of those things exist. Those three areas all exist and they get confused and conflated all the time. And, and people come up with conclusions that, see, it was meant to be. There was no, you know, he meant to die and his daughter went with him and they meant to go together because then they'd be together. Well, you know, that's kind of Monday morning quarterbacking, really. I mean, um, could there have been a soul? Let's use Kobe and his daughter, Gigi, for example. Just, I, I, I'm just conjecturing right now. We're just right, using it right. as an example. So let's say they did have a soul contract. Before they came in, before, she, so, you know, before she incarnated, 13 years ago and before he incarnated 41 years ago, they were on the other side, let's just say 50 earth years ago, because time is different on the other side. That's a whole other conversation. But let's say 50, 60 earth years ago, before, while they're on the other side, they have a soul contract, let's say. And they say, okay, let's get together. I want, you know, you be my daughter this time. I'll be your dad this time, et cetera, et cetera. And we get together, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> And they get together, um, and they are together, and it does work out. Soul contracts do not always work out, all right? Um, let's use them as an example. Maybe they had a soul contract that said, let's get together, and then you're going to be in the WNBA, Gigi, because that was their plan. She was really good basketball player, and there was conjecture, no, nothing written in stone, free will universe, but that she would – likely it's all probabilities right that's what the universe is is about probabilities life is about probabilities that she would end up in the WNBA but then terrible fog nobody could predict the weather and um, we don't know what the NTSB is NTSB is going to say the cause of but let's say the fog was a, a huge factor if not the cause of the accident <clears throat> and the accident happens and so their soul contract gets interrupted, you could say. The whole W, I'm going to get you into the WNBA that they agreed to 60 years ago, before, while they're on the other side. I'm conjecturing, okay? And then it gets interrupted by this accident. That happens. So see where this soul contract can exist and free will can exist. The free will of, 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 uh, of the pilot and Kobe and the other, all nine of them, to decide to choose to get onto that helicopter and go on that ill-fated flight. All of that can exist all at the same time in the way I, mm -hmm. Kelvin Chin at least, has thought about and perceives the universe. Mm -hmm. does, that, does that make sense? Yeah, it does actually. It does make sense. So um, just take a moment and tell everybody about your book, about mm -hmm. your trainings. That This will be a really good time. Okay, just real quick. So it's my, here's a copy of my book, uh, Overcoming the Fear of Death. And I talk about reincarnation in it, but I talk about other things. I talk about NDEs. 
of spiritually transformative experiences of various kinds, communicating with dead loved ones. My book is about, in a nutshell, it's a non-religious way to view death and dying to help reduce our fears about it so we can live our life more fully. And so it's also a way, like I'm speaking, Marilyn, actually, I'm speaking in uh, March at a uh, medical conference in Columbus, Ohio at the Ohio State University. Um, I was invited to speak and talk about my book to healthcare practitioners, to doctors, nurses, and hospital administrators. <clears throat> and my, my talk is going to be about my book, but specifically how they can talk to other people who don't share the same beliefs about death that they do. So how can a practitioner, a healthcare practitioner, who believes in heaven, talk to people, atheists? And how can an atheist, agnostic uh, healthcare practitioner, talk to people who believe in reincarnation and so forth? So I'm, I'm gonna talk about that, uh, use my book as a way, a tool to help them think and talk about it that, that uh, you know, that from that perspective. So that's essentially what my book does, is it looks at, at uh, death and dying from these four belief systems, the, eighth, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, scientist belief that there is no afterlife, the second belief system is fear of continued existence, in, uh, belief in an afterlife, but fear is associated with it somehow. Third belief system is belief in an afterlife, no fear. And the fourth belief system is reincarnation. And that book is available where? Say it. It's anywhere online around okay. the world. All right. Around the world. Around the world. Countries. Yeah. <laughs> and Just then Google, Google my name and it'll pop up. And your website, you offer trainings and and so forth, right? Yes. Yeah. So trainings on meditation. I've been teaching meditation for forty-seven years. Now, um, more than five thousand people. Uh, over 41 countries now. I just did an update and, um, uh, on, uh, and uh, counted again. It's 40, up to 41 countries, helping people with death and dying. And also, separately, I teach meditation, but sometimes that overlaps with the helping people with death and dying issues. So, it, you know, I, I want to um, say <clears throat> one, uh, just something about self promotion. Finally, <clears throat> um, the, our show is on um, iTunes, and I've tried that for years. So it's finally mm. there. So please sign up. This show included. We'd love to know that you're signing up and subscribing. Audio only. Audio only. Audio only. On iTunes. Okay. <clears throat> Audio only. Thank you for telling me. That. Well, that's a hot, that's how it would be, right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's how it is. ITunes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Audio only. Yeah, I was wondering why yeah. was there something I yeah. didn't. Well, when so, you oh yeah, Audio only. Right. Thank you. So and maybe then... he's he's remind. Uh, I'm not as he's, he's reminding me to mention that I have a YouTube channel and you can find it just by Googling my name. Perfect. So, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The show is, will be on Facebook and we'll have, we'll, you can see the video on, on YouTube, on mine, on Kelvin's, on Facebook and so forth, but sign up on, on um, iTunes. And then here are my books. There's four of them. Well, the opioid is coming. So in just one afternoon, listening to lots of men, twins, millennials, and soon beautiful stories about really wonderful people uh, impacted by opioid addiction should be out there soon on um, Amazon. So one of the things I wanted to ask you before we, before we end, yeah. and we don't have much time, but you know, there's a fear of death. Yes. And I think part of what I understand about understanding past lives is that kind of smooths over that fear of death somewhat? Yeah, you know, does. knowing that you can have a contract to come back, and yeah. that you have can have other other lives. What else? What is? What else would you say in a very short period of time sure. about this fear of death? Sure. Well, the fear of death um, in past lives, past lives can also unlock reasons for why you may have fears about death or other fears. So sometimes the knowledge about a past life can unlock that emotional pattern and free oneself up from those fears. Mm -hmm. um, but um, um, the fear of the f any kind of fear, fear of death, what's, what is it? It's the fear of uncertainty. And I think the past lives to fit where that fits in and helping reduce the fears of, about death and dying is that it becomes a little bit more when you, if you start to have memories, um, then you can, you, you can start to 
uh, feel a little bit more secure in the fact that you are going to continue because you have memories of being of continuing over multiple lifetimes. I think that in a nutshell is what it does, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, I don't want to I, I don't want right. to right. make people right. feel like you have to understand or remember your past lives. You look at your emotional patterns that will also unlock that for you. Right. Right. And and it's very important to understand this because we, we when we lose sight of the of the practicality of it, um, and we you know go off into the cocktail hour, it changes what? the value of what we're looking at. Yeah, this is right. look. This is about living life in the present. That's why, right. you know, I, I I I always say it's about how does this inform Kelvin Chin about who Kelvin Chin is. And there's this personality that's the, Kel the personality that's Kelvin Chin's personality, that's Richard's personality, that's Marcus's personality, mm -hmm. so forth, over the years, so forth, Peter's personality, et cetera. So there's a personality that's continued for thousands of years. So how does it inform me about that? That's what mm -hmm. helps me today. And there's a freedom attached. <laughs> you know, I'm all about freedom, breaking yes. free, right? So there yeah. is a freedom attached to recognizing how we go on and how we can maybe, you know, how things can, how they can be in a past life and, or coming up in a future life, you yes. know, that we it's, keep on going and we're with some of the people that we always love. Absolutely. And we can, we can create new families as we go forward together on the other side, we can get together and say, Hey, let's together and let's make a family together, whatever. You know, we can do these kinds of things. And, and the other thing is, it, it, it unlocks our creativity, I think. And it's a fun thing. Once you start thinking about life this way, life becomes more fun in the present because you can kind of start to be creative about the future, about how you're going to create your life now, the continual present going forward. Okay. Okay. We only have like a minute or two left. So, tell us why knowing this creates creativity going forward because it frees you up like you say you start to free up your your energy from being locked up with fear which is limiting and then you have more unlimited energy for now for, for now that you then take with you in the future life you because you you're always the, because you're always in the continual present exactly exactly so the more we learn the freer we get here the better we set ourselves up hopefully for a better life in the future or a that's way of using it, that's right? What I, that's what I do in all of my work, right. including, including my afterlife and reincarnation work. Right, exactly. So people just see, you know, they Google my name, they'll see it. If they Google my name, they'll see it all over the internet. I have like three pages worth of stuff on Google. You'll see it. Absolutely. So that's very important. I mean, that's kind of like coming to our end of our show is saying, live, for to, live, live this life, that's learn, it. learn from the past, this use it. it right use it to enhance this life and going forward this has been jesus's message since the beginning it's been jehovah's message for thousands and thousands and thousands of years right well this was good kelvin i want to thank you very much for bringing your wisdom experience your past lives and I know we didn't get into it today, but today is the Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I think as a child, yes. one of the memories that I had was of being in the Holocaust. And I know I was young when I had the memory. So it mm. couldn't have been something that I knew from this life because yeah. I was too young to know it. So at some point, I, it's something I, I, I just know I was. Exactly. You know, and I was so yeah. young, I couldn't have been. You know, I might have been three or four. I don't know. I was really young. So it's something I'm, I'm always curious about. So yep. thank you for being here with us today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's My fun. pleasure. Our, ple our pl pleasure. Blah, blah, blah. And thank you, everybody out there, for being with us today. We love you all very, very much and look forward to having you next week. So have a wonderful week. Bye-bye. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety 
or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Telestream's Wirecast Software, StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.